uncertainty of, of tenfold, right? If you looked at the CNN article, they say to whom, what's a pangolin worth? To a hunter, it's worth 22 and a half dollars. To a low level trader, $45. To a mid level trader, $80. To a high-level trader, $265. To a restaurant in Vietnam, $350. Okay? If we look at the number of uh, wildlife products from pangolins traffic every year, 10,000 in pangolins, 1,000 in rhinos, 200 in tigers. Now, here's a question. Is the problem the person who hunts? Or is it the person who well, has the demand? What's, what's the problem here? The demand. Okay. So, should we educate hunters or consumers? Sorry, Mona has a question. Okay, but the hunter hunts to get money, right? So it's not just the consumer. If I don't eat the pangolin or I don't do voodoo with the pangolin, then, then the hunter will find something else to hunt. So we are just shifting the pressure. Okay. So I think it's both. I think, I think both parties are responsible for what's going on, not just, not just the consumer. Okay. Um, who's going to fund this? Conservation requires money. Who do you think would fund pangolin conservation? It's a charismatic species. If you sell it right, it's cool. If you sell it right, it's cool. So how do we sell it right? No, that's not my job. That's why they're conservation NGOs, no? Okay. Is it the job of conservation NGOs to sell conservation? Sure. Why? Well, because money needs to be raised for conservation, so... Somebody's got to do it. Somebody's got Okay. I know you're saying that facetiously, but... This is, you know, people think about development as being an industry. One might also think about conservation as being an industry. Right? We have to make, look, make, make things look important in order to do conservation. Do people care about pangolisms as a, and pangolins in the same way as they care about elephants? What is the strategy to overcome this large number of trafficked pangolins? Is it greater enforcement at ports? Is it changing behaviors and attitudes? How do we convince an economically marginalized hunter to stop killing pangolins? Like Mona said, maybe the hunter might simply shift from pangolin to something else. Hi, Lou. By just creating alternative income source. Okay, let's talk about that. This is, a, this is a great point, creating alternative income sources. Like what? Uh, it depends on the interest of the, 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 the hunters. Okay. Different individuals have different interests, so we have to think about their interests. So, so if a hunter has known how to hunt, what are the opportunities for somebody whose livelihood has been defined as a hunter? Uh, look, uh, maybe that individual hunters because he has not or he doesn't have any clue about any other source of income. Okay. So first of all, uh, we can give uh, awareness or uh, education in different... Uh, you, don't you think that's been done? Uh, somehow there is, but I don't think it is enough. So, so we need to do more educating? Yeah. No. no. But how do you no? convince somewhere and tell, the, tell somebody who's been doing this for their entire life or maybe third generation or whatever generation doing this that it's wrong and they need to stop? Is it them who don't understand us or is it us who don't understand them? We don't understand them. Okay. Mike said, no, we shouldn't do more education and awareness. Tell me why. <laughs> because um, the level at, of, at which he's saying that we should do that, is, to me, is not a problem because they are aware 
they haunt us. I think um, the issue of demand and the income you get from the resource, that's what is pushing them to get, okay. to, get to that particular species. Okay. Sounds like we're getting more and more complicated. That's good. Okay. So, again, let's put this in the back of our minds and think about what has worked for some and not others. And here are some possible solutions, right? I'm not going to talk about the behavior and education component because I think that is a much larger conversation and to do it justice we need to dedicate some separate time to that so please feel free to come and talk to me about the pros and cons of that. But I'm going to talk about three things. Hunting, payments for ecosystem services and incorporating communities into development. Right? And here we have to go back to this question which is does the type of species matter to go about how we deploying conservation strategies? And what if we were conserving the near extinct, town can correct me here, Panamanian golden frog? It's small. It's, it's still. It's not a golden toad. Ah, uh, then Wikipedia is wrong. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Yeah. So here's an example of if we're going to conserve an, uh, a rhino, for example, rhino. I think you would all agree that it's important to conserve rhinos, right? But the habitat requirements for a rhino are so completely different from that of a cheetah. In fact, they're the exact opposite. Cheetahs like nice, open, flat plains. Rhinos like dense, bushy, woody areas. So how do you go about conserving both those species at the same time? And so here is one idea, which, right, which, which you've all heard about in some way, shape or form before, which is hunting as a solution and some propose it to be a success story. Right? And so the idea here is hunters, usually those from overseas, are willing to pay several tens of thousands of dollars to shoot and kill as part of a thrill of sport. Uh, an elephant that is old, it's on its last legs, it's of no value to the ecosystem and I can use that fifty or sixty thousand uh, dollar money uh, from the hunting permit to use in conservation strategies. Okay, and so the pro for this is that conservation pays for itself; it's funding conservation. What would be a counter argument to this? Everyone thinks this is a good idea. So Kate says you continue to encourage demand. Okay? No, that's the, so I'll just say that that's not the case because the demand in this case is for an individual who shot an individual animal. Mm -hmm. So there is no demand outside of the individual who kills the animal. So you're, we're not talking about trading ivory from the trophies, we're just talking about the trophies. So the demand is specific to the person that I does I guess I was killing. thinking in the sense of continuing to encourage uh, yeah, the sports hunting of megafauna, but uh, it's not an area that I am more versed in. I'm just more yeah. Okay. Um, what do others, Ben? I'm getting so much exercise from this. I think, I think this would be well for certain areas. For certain areas, for okay. East Africa, where you have a lot of savanna areas, and you can easily excite animals and hunt them to be attractive. Okay. Maybe you have to take the other side of the corner where you have maybe rainforest areas, where it's uh -huh. difficult to even see an animal. Uh huh. Then they may not benefit from such, or this may not be a good solution. Okay. So let's go to Zimbabwe. And we have a hunting party that goes and kills a lion. Now you, you heard about this, I assume. Cecil the Lion, right? There was a huge international uproar about the killing of the lion. Strangely, very little of that uproar actually came from Africa. It came from the West, right? How do you know? You'd have to have a very experienced hunter guide to tell you that this is an old male 
is separated from the rest of the herd, is on its last legs. How do you separate a good hunting safari guide from a bad hunting safari guide? Does the hunter, is the hunter able to make that distinction? As was the case with what we saw. The hunter assumed that the lion was not inside a protected area. But it is of immense economic value, right? And this means that we have to learn to think differently again. Now, would you consider this right or wrong? Hi, Lou. Mona says it's food, it's right. What do we call this? Anyone? What do we call this when we see it? Don't say poaching, you'll make him happy. Bushmeat. Bushmeat. <laughs> Is this right or wrong? What do we call this? <laughs> Trophy. <laughs> okay, um, hunting, right? This is bush meat, but this is hunting. <laughs> do you see the contradictions that are emerging here? Okay. Let's talk about. No, no, but tell us what is the contradiction. Don't let me. Um, uh, so, so I believe that um, you know there is an unfair victimization of resource poor people who need things for their daily subsistence and we tend to think of them as being part of the problem but not something like this in broad senses okay and we can debate the nuances later but I think Mona said something that's very sensible those guys are killing to eat they're but that's not the way most conservation organizations would view this. I don't, I don't pay attention to that. <laughs> the other thing is they're killing something that's smaller. But could be highly endangered. In that case, it probably isn't. And it's certainly a species that's not going to be numbers limited like your elephant. This? If this was a red diker and you know, you're living on the edge of a forest, uh, this is a huge loss for the whole species. Okay. So yeah, but I agree with the point. It's okay. If you hunt a common species versus a rare but species, but it's where's a big the line where you say, okay, we have to preserve the species? Um, sorry, you can't hunt and feed your family. And the question is here with the elephant. Okay, that sucks. We're all upset this is about for it. sport. But but again. Is, the, is all that meat going to go to waste, or is the meat and the hide going to be utilized? Okay, so one argument that a lot of hunting companies make is that we distribute the meat to local people, right? What does that do? It encourages dependency, right? Anyway, there are lots of nuances to this, and again, we're just skimming the surface. We'll get more into it. Let's think about the other main sort of conservation success story, though I don't necessarily consider it a success story, as you've heard from my previous presentations, right? which is this idea of bringing local communities closer to um, natural resource management. And this largely occurs through, you know, so you have the building of a tourist lodge, local people are employed in the lodge, gives them an alternative livelihood. Hailu said, we need to give them alternative livelihoods. That's great. Let's go put a national park way out in the border with Sudan, where it's so difficult for tourists to get there. But we'll build a lodge anyway. And we'll have these tourism adventures. We'll employ local people. There'll be guides. There'll be cooks. There'll be drivers. And you know, they, they can sort of say, oh, you know, we might even put in a little bit of money. The community might put in a little of money in it. We'll have this as a co-sharing agreement. We'll share the profits from the lodge quite equitably. Um, we'll diversify our local economies. We might even have some alternatives, right? Like have some apiculture, have some honey that gets derived from this. And so the advantage of something like this is to say, look, it provides alternative livelihoods. It's a source of economic security. The counter argument to this is that it doesn't really address the needs of local people. Local people will say, we need clean water, we need healthcare. 
thanks for the job, but my children are dying. Right? The other argument is that tourism ventures tend to be highly seasonal, right? What if you're in Egypt and there's some sort of tragedy, which seems to be occurring quite regularly in Egypt, right? First you have shootings, then you have downed airplanes and so on, right? That affects the tourist economy. The tourist economy in Sharm el-Sheikh now is not doing very well, right? So what do you do if you're plugging all that investment into having communities be part of local ventures? That's what you would say, but the tourists are not going. Right? <laughs> he has to say that. Okay? The third argument or the third success story is the payment for ecosystem services argument. And this is where I'd like Mona to jump in a little bit here. Um, you can come up here with me if you want. Um, and here the basic idea is that you pay people, that people will make good decisions if they feel they are incentivized to do so. Okay. And the basic premise here is that a financial incentive speaks more. Right? And so, and this can take very many different forms, right? But you'd have to say, look, in order to preserve, we need certain metrics. And so, uh, so if we pay you to conserve, it means that you re reduce your uh, resource extraction. Don't go into the forest and deforest. And we'll pay you not to do that. Right? How many, you guys have, have you heard about this before? Yeah, okay. The counter argument to this is that it, it's, you have to think about whether economic or financial incentivization is the best way by which to incentivize. In other words, is it just money that talks? What about if you want to maintain your ancestral rights to resources? What do you guys think? Mona, let's hear your thoughts. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Keep talking. Okay, let's, let's go to the participants. Haile, what do you think? Just jump for the time being. Say that again? Jump for the time being. Okay, I jump for the time being. Fikrata? Yes. What do you think? What do I think about? About payments for ecosystem services. Good idea, bad idea, undecided? Both. Both, both a good and a bad idea. Yes. So why would it be both? Um, as a positive side, the positive sides are good and you pay people, that way they are not degrading and okay. everyone is happy. Okay. But sometimes I, I think it could also create a way of engineering a utilitarian um, aspect where you encourage certain species so you can get money uh -huh. by local, you know, modifying ecosystem functionings. Okay. Other thoughts? Mike? You haven't spoken. Yeah. You're next, don't worry. I, I think that uh, the idea is, is a little bit um, good, but I have a, a worry because um, who is going to set the the value for for the resources. Yeah. What? Are, how much do you pay for it? That's a, and and I think that is the bone of contention when it comes to the implementation of payments for ecosystems. Services. How do you decide what value? How should that money be distributed? Whom should it be distributed to? Right. And so we say the devil is in the details. And so Mona would probably say that we shouldn't be so quick to dismiss payments for ecosystem services just yet because we don't have a good strong enough body of knowledge to tell us whether it is a success or a failure. And perhaps it much really depends on the local context, it depends on the relationship between local people and the conservation practitioners, it depends on whether they're listening or not, and so on. Lee. Well, and so another question is what is the source of 
financing for repayment for ecosystem services? Right. Uh, great question. Where is the source of this funding coming from? Um, there are very many international initiatives for this. Um, the UN, the World Bank, and several public part private partnerships do fund these programs, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I have a scenario whereby we can make some discussion. Okay. The, uh, I come from Mondogana and we do have forests uh -huh. uh, around the catchment. Uh -huh. And that forest is rich in biodiversity. Mm -hmm. However, it is facing some challenges currently. Uh, we know that Kawasa town, Shashamane and other areas are getting water from that catchment. Right. But they are not contributing to the conservation of that forest. So there's extraction without necessarily reinvestment. Yeah. Okay. And the local community are nowadays extracting more than before. More than before. Because okay. Because they are not getting any benefit out of it at the, at the return of what they have been conserving. Right. Okay. So I, I hope there must be some payment. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Those are all really good and really important points and ones that we should consider more strongly. But as always, I encourage more debate and about dialogue. We don't really move forward unless we debate these issues much more uh, strongly. Fikret. Wait, 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 wait. The microphone has to come there. Do you think uh, payments for eco e ecosystem services encourage uh, the sustained sort of cash inflow from the north to the south? Also, also do you think uh, developing countries are uh, f you know, fearful of selling or losing their sovereignty or you know, in global negotiations to developed yeah. countries? So two really great questions. One is, um, does it reinforce uh, uh, a particular, uh, the cycle of money flowing from the north to south, right? Um, that's a great point. I think it does to some extent, although uh, proponents for payment ecosystem services will say, well, we need to think about creative ways of making this sustainable, right? And so that it simply just doesn't become a money flow, but something much more than that, perhaps a flow of ideas, perhaps a flow of technologies, and so on. Uh, the second point, which is, um, just remind me really quickly. Uh, yeah. 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 So, so this is often, th uh, so what we see happening in Paris this week, we haven't seen very much of it in the news for the last couple of days because the negotiators are still hammering out pieces of the text for the intergovernmental plan of climate change at the, at the Paris conference. But it's really about thinking, um, you know, what is the role, so, so when we think about a payments for ecosystem services a scheme, who is exactly is doing the payments, which is what your first question is, and then who is responsible for maintaining the ecosystematic services? And that largely falls onto local communities. The state really doesn't get involved in that, right? Which is where you have intermediary conservation partners to help train local people to make sure they can serve effectively, right? Uh, the literature thus far is, again, both sides of the, the coin here. I don't think there's a unanimous agreement one way or the other. But my reading of the literature seems to suggest that such schemes, such payment for ecosystem schemes, tend to reproduce very, um, very simple ideas of what nature is. And part of that is that local people cannot be part of that nature. So it doesn't really help in that respect. And this is particularly true of mangroves, but could be different for different types of ecosystems. So below, you're, you're kind of going through a set of of kind of conventional tools or what has become conventional tools in the last 25, 30 years. And it's clear that you like some things about these things and you dislike a lot of things about these things. And I agree with you entirely in your emphasis on, on all players and not excluding local communities. Right. I guess it's a two-part question. Part one is, what, in your view, does work? And part two is, isn't a lot of this so context-dependent 
that what one has to do is look at this whole toolbox of possible solutions, of possible incentives, of possible resources, and pick the one that applies to the particular challenge. Great question. So what do I believe works? Um, I think at the root of it, there might be so many different things that work, but the, o the overwhelming metric for what would work would be increased communication that occurs between different parties. I think a lot of pro pro problems, no matter what the context is, would work if we have significant communication, right? Now, there are language barriers, not just between Amharic or English or something like that, but in what exactly is said and how it's interpreted. You might speak the same language, you, but you may not understand each other. Okay. So I think that's really important. And part of that is that we need to be able to integrate, and I'm coming to this point. Um, it's actually my next slide. How can we have a productive conversation moving forward? And so the point I'm making here, which is enhanced communication. Okay. I want to go to Lee here because he looks like he has something yes. really important.